All right, I need you to do the following. You need to take out the following things. First of all, piece of scrap paper. A pencil, preferably a regular pencil. If you've got a mechanical one, that will work. And a ballpoint pen. Most pens are ballpoint. We don't want a felt tip. Then borrow from somebody. Go look for it. I will repeat, you need scrap paper, a pencil, a ballpoint pen, and the final thing is the homework that's due today, fingerprinting. Yes. Look in the jar right there, Bianca, see if there's a pen. If you don't have a pen, borrow from somebody. If you were gone on Friday, you need to pick up the assignment in the back. No, I don't need that. Okay, before you turn in fingerprinting to me, I want you to look for a few things. First of all, turn to the last page. Those should all be answered, Taylor, you might want to do this. Incomplete sentences. That includes number seven. Just because they're number doesn't mean I expect them to be you know, incomplete. Should be complete sentences. All the answers came from the text that was on that worksheet. I hope you remember to do the other portions where you identified the Galton characteristics on the giant print and then you found the five things that differed from your print and the suspect prints and you answered all those in complete sentences as well. On the front, make sure you put your name, date, period, and station number. And then go ahead and pass those up. You should have everything else off your desk. Try to stay in your desk, Chris. Everything else off your desk so that you have space to do our next activity. I'm going to pass out some tape to you now. I would like you to take six pieces that are this long, this long. Okay? Not this long, this long. Okay? I, I'm sorry, I said six, I mean five. Take five pieces and put them on this edge of your, of your desk right here so that you don't accidentally bump up against them and mess it up. Once you get your five, pass the roll back. When everyone has it, you can pass those up to the room. Not not right now. You can do it here in a little bit. Okay. Now, as you're getting the materials there, you're getting that tape passed back, I want to go through and kind of give you an overview of what we have left and where we are in this mystery. Right now, we're here on the 13th, and we're going to complete the Henry system of fingerprinting. That is going to be an in-class activity. This is... Fingerprinting 101 or 102, it's the intermediate. You already learned the Galton system. And you know that prints are classified into one of three groups, which are? Loop, arch, and whirl. That's it. We're not getting rid of that system. What we're doing is we're taking it a step further. We're going from three to eight. So we have more groups. Makes it... Uh, easier to figure out which one it belongs in because each one is a little more specific. And it also makes it easier to do our matching later. So you have to learn this system and you still are going to apply what you learned in the last one, the Galton characteristics. I'm referring to the little detailed characteristics. What's the term for that, the detailed characteristics? Give you a hint, it starts with an M. Minutia. Who said that? Dakota? Okay. Minutia are the detailed characteristics. How many different kinds of minutia are there? How many? Three. three? No, there are three groups. I'm talking about the little detailed characteristics. Chris? Five. Five, no. How many total are there? Andy? Okay, just get it from another row. 30. You get a star for that one. There are over 30 different minutia points. 
Okay, we learned five, Chris, so you were right about that. We had to learn five to match up. But the minutia, the point of the minutia is not just to classify the print, but to pin it down. This one matches the one found at the scene of the crime, point for point. So those little details, we're still going to use what we learned on Friday in the Galton system. We're going to use that tomorrow and the next day when we get into looking at our suspect and crime scene prints. On one day you'll classify the suspect prints, the next one you'll classify the crime scene prints, and then you'll look at both and you'll find your match. And once you've got it classified, it'll make it quicker to find the match. But when you do the matching, that's when you look at the little detail characteristics, the five things we talked about. We're going to review that here in a little bit. By Friday, we'll get into the white powder lab. And you'll get your, you'll do the lab then, but on the Monday you'll do, finish the write-up on that. And then we'll begin the bite mark lab. Now, a lot of you have already made conclusions about the white powder on the brownie. Well, you haven't done any tests yet. And once you get those results, you may find that it's not quite what you thought. Okay, or maybe it is what you thought. Maybe it goes with your theory, maybe it doesn't. But you can't know for sure until you run the lab. So we're going to find out what that white powder is. And then that's only half of the riddle. The other half is figuring out who bit the brownie. And that's very involved. And you're going to have to learn the expert, or learn what an expert would learn about bite marks and teeth so that you can identify and see who bit the brownie. Yes? I just wanted to have, like, uh, have already. <coughs> we wrote that, do you recall? Well, we didn't write it, we didn't know. Oh, well, know you were supposed to have written that. Yes, you see, the. Having a hypothesis or a theory at this point helps focus your investigation so that you know this is an important clue, this is not. For instance, if your theory has something to do with drugs being involved and that they gave her drugs and you think the drugs were given through the brownie, that's a very important clue. If you don't think drugs were involved at all, then this isn't going to matter to you as much. But one way or the other, this will either make someone look more or less guilty, as will the fingerprints. The fingerprints won't prove someone's guilt, okay? An eyewitness would go a long way towards that, but the fingerprints don't prove it. What the fingerprints will do is they'll tell me or suggest where a suspect was and maybe in some cases suggest when they were there. Get it? But it's each of these together, piece by piece, that help put my story together. And if you go back to when we started this whole mystery, I said it's like tearing pages out of a novel and you have page 67, page 10, page 136, and you don't know the page numbers. So you don't know what order they go in, but you have to take all these individual pieces and put them together to tell a story. And that's exactly what you're going to do at the end. So after that, we go on Thanksgiving break. We come back. We do a fiber lab. We do an ink lab. Then we get into handwriting and lip print and tire track and shoe print all down here in December. And then you've got all the physical evidence. Now you have to put it together to tell a story of what happened. You're going to work on a PowerPoint presentation for four days in the computer lab. And your homework during that time will be a big writing assignment. You'll write up, this is your final version of what happened. And in this write up, you will include the means, the motive, the opportunity, and what all the physical evidence tells you. And at the very end of this, you'll tell me the story. It'll be just like a novel here. You'll tell me the story of what happened. This is your version of the events, okay? Your PowerPoint will do that, but you'll work on that as part of a group. You'll do your piece, and your group will put it all together, and then we'll share those. We'll share those here, and then you'll have a test, okay? And a lot of the stuff on the test does have to do with the fingerprinting that I talked about on Friday and that I'm talking about today. The only other thing I'll point out here is that the extra credit, I'll bring that up to you on Tuesday, next Tuesday. It is due on the 7th, which is this Friday here. And I would suggest if you think you want to do it, you can already go to my webpage under forensics and look for extra credit. And it's one of these, it's these um, paper models of the human body. And you can read and follow the directions. I'm not really going to tell you much more than what's already in those directions. But that's when it will be due, okay? In case you want to get a head start on that. Any questions? All right. So what we want to do now 
is I'm going to pass out to you this worksheet. It's patterns in the Henry system, so you can learn the Henry system of classification. And I want you to read this front page and read through the part where it talks about the new kinds of worlds. And you can stop when you get to the work on that. What we want to do now is make sure that you, you know each of these eight well. And once you've found the category, you've classified it as a plain arch, a tented arch, then you know the group to look at. You don't have to compare as many prints. The advantage of having eight like this is now we only have to look at one eighth of all the prints. We don't have to look at just one third, which was what we used before. So now you found a match. Let's say they're both tented arches. Now you've got to look at the details. So we're still going to use those Galton characteristics. Can you name the five? What are they? Uh, island, dot, ending ridge, uh, and, uh, enclosure. Enclosure. Excellent. Okay. So you need to know all five of those. And with experience, I think after Thursday, when you've done this for a couple of days, they're just going to pop right out at you. As you look at this page, does anyone see a couple forks right off the bat that just pop out? And Helica, you want to come up and circle them in green for us? Now remember, we can see these all over the print. We're going to focus on the center part. The what of the print? Center. What's it called? The core of the print. <laughs> Thank you, Dakota. The core of the print. So that would be in this area right over here, all of this. And so we show a fork here and another fork down here. Good job. All right, I need someone to come up and show me a couple dots. Ruben? Uh, blue? Now dots can be tricky sometimes because if you don't have a good print, it could just be an incomplete line. But that's clearly a dot. It's isolated on either side. Yeah, there's some down low too, still. Possibly. How about another one down low? Yeah, there's another dot. Okay, so we have our fork, we have the dot. Now I need an enclosure. Thank you, Jack. Come on up. Remember, the enclosure is also known as. Yeah. Also known as what? Nobody remembers? Enclosure or oval. They can be short. They can be an actual oval. They can be real long, stretched out ovals. You might see another one like right here. You see how this all forms an oval? That's one long oval right there. And incidentally, it's also right here is a fork. You often see that at the ends of ovals, okay? All right, uh, what do we have left now? Islands. Islands. We need a line that's longer than it is thick, that's isolated on all sides. Can I get someone else that hasn't been up here? I appreciate it, but I'd like to get someone else. B and A, thank you. Wow, that's unusual that you raised your hand like that. Come on up. Come on up. <laughs> You know those auctions you go to, you got to be careful. If you scratch your nose, you just bought a $1,000 painting or something. You don't raise your hand. Well, not that it's a $1,000. Uh, do it in a color so we can see it. I don't care which one. We're looking for islands. No, what are we looking for? Islands. Yeah, islands. So we circled dots before. Islands are like long dots. A line that's isolated. I'll give you a hint. There are several in this general area. There's one. One more. One more. Right nearby. Maybe. How about this one right here? There you go. All right. Lastly, the ending ridge. Probably the trickiest of them all. Ruben? Come on up. Well, they're tricky because it doesn't count if they're over here. It has to end in the core and it has to come from off the page. Uh, well, can I erase something? Cause it's like sure. Way. Yeah. Yeah. 
think that's one right there. Okay, so where does it come from then? Okay, it has to come from <laughs> off the page, the side or the bottom of the print, and come into the core and in there. Oh, okay. That's so where it gets a little trickier. Over here. Well, no, see, that's not ending in the core. It has to end in the oh, core. Oh, okay. Yeah, there is one in this area, though, that I see. Uh, it goes off the page, but ends in the core. You see one end. All right, Angelica, you're up. Maybe that one? <coughs> no? Well, see, that starts up here. Why don't you use a color for me, okay? What's this one? I can't see. Can you move your hand? Hey, I, generally, guys, what's going to happen with the Indian bridges is they'll come in like this, or like this, into the middle and stop. So now you see one, Marla? Okay, well that's that's the same one that was it Ruben circle? And yeah, that technically I that would be correct. It does start all the way off here and it hooks around and ends here. I was looking at this one right here. Did you guys see that one? Okay, because that one's pretty clear, it comes in and ends. But you know, and you could call this an ending ridge. It's also a fork right here, but this part where it comes in and it ends, it would be considered an ending ridge. You need to be familiar with these because these are the types of things that you're going to point out in your PowerPoint, in your write-up at the end that proves that we have a match on a fingerprint. Because if that print is proving someone's guilt, proving that they committed a murder or something like that, that's pretty serious stuff. And what often happens when we get to this tomorrow and the next day, and on, on Thursday you're doing the actual match, is people jump to conclusions. They see these two prints and they go, well, that's a match. And it may be, but you better evaluate more than one thing. If you just see this part right here, okay, and you go, oh, same thing right there, it's a match. You're going to convict someone to life in prison or potentially death on one thing that matches on their fingerprint. I would think you'd want a lot more proof than that. Because let's, let's consider this, guys. Let's say that this is the uh, suspect print. When I say suspect print, imagine we took someone, a suspect, into custody and we printed them. We did you know, the rolling of the fingers and we got complete prints on all their digits. Head up, please. So we're going to have a nice, perfect print to compare to. But the one that we're going to try to match comes from the crime scene. Now the crime scene print, you know, they don't go around and do this. Place their fingers, you know, just perfectly down so they get nice prints. What we end up with is incomplete prints, maybe a portion of this. So it could be that all of this is not even seen. And it could be, we've got to clean that off. It could be that in here they had some dirt or something on their hands so we couldn't see that part. So when we go to do a match, what we look at is what we can see here. If it shows up, in the crime scene, it'll definitely be here. Got it? This is going to be the whole picture. This will just be a part of that picture. So anything I see, if I see this here, I need to see it here. The exact same plates on the print. Every single thing that remains should be matching. And I would encourage you guys to match at least three minutia points. Now, I don't require you to write it out. But I'm telling you that if you just say, oh, that matches because it looks the same, that's not good enough. Every year, people misidentify, mismatch prints. That shouldn't happen. Every single thing should match here. You should be 100% confident that that's the same print. But if you only look at one thing, you will be misled. Any questions on that? All right. So now we got to get to the important part. I need to see that you truly understand what each of these different prints are because you're going to be classifying yours here in a little bit and the suspect and crime scene prints over the next two days using this system. 
we still have the three Galton groups. We still have arches, we still have loops, and all of these here, along the bottom, are worlds. What we've done is we've broken them into smaller groups that are more specific. So you need to make sure you understand the difference between each of these. If you have questions, please ask. On Friday, we learned about the arch. Well, sometimes the arch rises up gradually and falls out the other side. Sometimes it rises quite dramatically and goes out the other side. And then there are versions in between that go up a little bit more, maybe not as much as that. Well, it's easy to see why they call this a tented arch, because it looks like a tent. And this a plain arch. But what's going to happen to you guys, head up Shona, is that you'll see in between ones. And you won't know whether it's plain or tented arch. So I'm going to give you a rule that will help you decide, okay? First, you want to do, first thing you want to do is kind of pick out what the core is. Remember, the core is the middle interesting part of the print where most of the lines are changing direction. You don't want to look outside the core. For this one, this would be the core here. For this one, this would be the core here. If you look outside the core, every print looks like a... Every one of these prints outside the core will look like what? Uh, an, arch. an arch. The tops of all of these do little arches. So you can't look at that area. You've got to look inside the core in this area alone. So I look at the core and I look at two things. I look at how wide this is. Okay, it's about that wide. And I look at how tall it is. And it's about that tall. Do you see that it is wider than it is tall? Shake your head yes if you see that. That it's wider this way than it is tall this way. Okay. Over on this one, we look at the dimension here. This is the width. And then we look at this dimension here. And this is the height. Well, kind of overdid it there, but you get the idea. So, this one is clearly taller than it is wide. So that's what makes it a tented arch. So my rule for you to remember is, if it is as wide as, as it is tall, then it's a plain arch, or anything shorter than that. Okay? Shorter than the width or equal to the width would be a plain arch. As soon as this measurement gets taller, bigger than this measurement, then it's a tented arch. Get it? So if it's as tall as it is wide, plain arch. If it's any higher than that, tented arch. And it can get tricky sometimes because you'll get some things that are in between there. All right. From now on, you don't say arch. If you just write down arch when you're classifying these, you're going to get them wrong. You need to be specific. Plain or tented arch. Loops. You already know that loops can come from the left or from the right. And if they come from the right side, we call it an ulnar loop, named after the ulna bone, the bone on the pinky side, the radial bones on the thumb side. I was going to sing you a lullaby. You look so peaceful there. Do you understand why, Zach, I don't let people put their head on their desk? For just that reason? You want to sit up, please? You were on your way. You started to do this. I was waiting for you to fall out of your, your seat there. I'm sorry I can't make this more interesting, but you do need to follow along. Okay. Now, obviously, the ulna and the radius are different on the other arm. It's going to be a mirror image of it. So what we've done is we've just decided that all the looping lines that come from the right side will be called ulnar loops. If it comes from the left side, it will be radial loops. And let me just show you how I remember that. See the R here? Comes right before the loop. See the L here? Comes right before the loop. That's how I remember it. A radial loop comes from the left side, and ulnar loop comes from the right side. Got it? Okay. Again, don't be thrown off because all the other lines up here do arches. The core is this part right in here. That's the part we're interested in. All right. Moving on to all the different varieties of worlds. Here's the world we saw on Friday. 
got a circle in the middle, small little circle or dot, and a bunch of circles that go around the outside. The question you should be asking yourself is, what do most of the lines in the core do? If most of the lines in the core, the majority, do circles like that, it's going to be a plain world. Ruben. Are you I would tell you, but I'd have to kill you. He's a karate teacher. Anyway, so the majority of the lines do a little circle there. This is a plain world. Now, when we look at the central pocket loop, what you see is a world pattern in the center, but it's smaller. You have your dot or your circle. You have some circles that go around the outside, but it's not the entire core. Okay, A lot of the core has looping lines. You can see them here. They come around and they encircle the world. They loop around it like so. So we've got a pocket in the middle, a central pocket, that looks like a world surrounded by a loop pattern. That's why it's called a central pocket loop. This can also come from this side, and it still would be a central pocket loop. Everybody understand that? Now, again, people get confused on these. They mix these two up all the time, because you see some lines here that come around. Sometimes they see that, and they think that that's a central pocket loop. No, we're all going to have lines like that that arch over this. If you only have, like, let's say you just have one little circle in here surrounded by looping lines. What is that? That's a loop. In this case, that would be an ulnar loop. Okay? When it's a central pocket loop, you're going to have a little mini world. So you're going to have more than just one line in there. You're going to have a circle. You're going to have numerous circles. Got it? Okay. The double loop can get a little confusing too. You're gonna have maybe one or two of these. They're pretty rare. Some of you in here might have a double loop. You've seen uh, maybe the Korean flag. You have the yin yang, they call it the um yang, on the flag. And it's got the red part and the blue part. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And they kind of blend into each other. You know, this little thing here. And we got our little, like that, right? And half of it's blue and the other half is red. Well, that's kind of what's happening here on our double loop. Instead of our loop just coming in from the side, it comes in and it curves. You can see that there are a series of looping lines that come in from this side and they kind of curve and hook around. And then you've got other looping lines that come in this way and they curve and loop around, okay? So you've got these two loops that are hooked at the end and intertwined, okay? They come around each other. That's what makes it a double loop. And again, you've got to focus just on the core of the print. The last one is kind of the none of the above one. It's the catch-all. If after you've evaluated the print and none of these labels apply, You've, you've thrown all these out. It isn't de it's definitely not one of those. Then you call it an accidental, yeah. An accidental print looks like you took some of these in, the, in a car and they drove into a wall and got in an accident, okay? This one looks like it's a combination of a whirl and maybe a central pocket loop or a double loop. We see lines that come over like this. Okay, like you would see in a double loop, but then you don't have the other one that hooks into it. Instead, it looks like you've got a loop that comes out this side, but in the middle of that loop, you've got what looks like a little whirl, but it's not really a whirl. So it's kind of a combination of several different things. That's when you call it an accidental. These are rare. These are pretty rare. These are less rare. These, the rest of these are all very common. Got it? You're going to be able to identify these because you're going to do this on your own here in a second. Okay, last thing to show you, and then I'll leave you to your own devices to go through the three things up here. This is a, a useful little tidbit to know when you're trying to figure out what kind of prints you've got. It's a thing called a delta. In the Greek alphabet, delta is a triangle. Okay? In science, we use that little triangle as shorthand for change. So I might say, you know, delta temp. That means change in temperature, for example. 
in fingerprinting, the delta represents the part of the print where you see a lot of change. On all of these prints, you'll see a place around which the print appears to change. And often, it looks as if there's a little Y, or, because delta is the shape of a triangle, it may even look like an actual triangle. Let me point out some deltas here, okay? It's a triangle. It's actually shaped like that. Here you've got one that's shaped like, like that, right here. Over here, you've got one that goes like that, like the example I put on the board. Same thing here. Down here, you see one here, you see one here. Here's one here. The other one of this is probably off the page somewhere. Uh, here's one here, and here's one here. There's one there, and there's one there. Now, I don't know if you guys could pick those out as quickly as I could, but with experience, you will. Those lists jump right out at you. Now, who cares? Well, here's why you care. You're stuck. You're not sure what kind of print that is. Well, if you know if it's a loop, arch, or whirl, it really does help you out. So first thing you look for is the delta. Now, the only deltas we're interested in are the ones that are outside the core. This is the core of the print here. <coughs> Tell me, how many deltas, remember they only count if they're outside the core, does an arch have? How many deltas does an arch have? They only count if they're outside the core. Yeah. Zero. That's inside. That's inside. So arches will never have a delta outside the core. Therefore, they have zero deltas outside the core. You can always tell an arch because that little change point is in the middle. How many deltas will loops always have? One. And it will always be just outside the core. Do you see it there? How many deltas will whirls always have? Two, and they'll be just outside the core, assuming that we get the whole thing on our print. Sometimes the print runs off the page and that makes your work a little harder. Head up, Taylor. Okay, does everyone understand how to use the deltas now? Okay, here's what you're gonna do now with the worksheet that I gave you. Part one, you're gonna print yourself. This time, instead of running the tape across your finger this way, we're gonna do it vertically and go all the way down past that crease so you get the entire thing. Make sure you get some of the edge too, you know, not just right there in the middle, so you get the entire thing. When you put the tape down, put it above the label. So it says thumb here, put the tape down above the label. So you print yourself, that's step one. Step two, go and classify those prints using these terms. Don't just say arch, say plain arch or tented arch. Classify it on the line. If you put your print below the label instead of above it, it's going to be all wrong. Tyler, stay with me here. Third part, after you classify, go back and on each print, identify three of the Galton characteristics I just showed, like a dot, a fork, and an ending ridge, or whatever that you want to do. Three characteristics. I'm going to pass out magnifying glasses to help you show. 